continuing to do that since they're working into my time right now. I'm going to ask Breanne, Kyle, if you come up with Madeline. So we're going to uh, dedicate Madeline to the Lord this morning. Amen. They're kind of new to the church. Um, they live on kind of an affluent block, same one I live on. So it's, uh, it, yeah. But they're good, good kids, and I've spent a lot of time just working with them. But they, I didn't even know you were pregnant until about three or four weeks before you were having the baby. So good way of hiding it. I don't know how you did it. But here in the Assemblies of God in most Protestant churches is we don't baptize babies. We believe that babies, when uh, we can dedicate ourselves to bringing them up in the fear of God, and when they get to be of age, they'll want to naturally be baptized for themselves. Their choice, not our choice for them. And so that's what we're doing this morning. And what a privilege. Heck, I used to do this all the time. Now I'm kind of, I'm kind of out of practice, so I'm glad you're here. But, you know, in the Old Testament, they would bring their kids up to the Lord and dedicate them to God. But what we're really doing again, you as parents, remember that song I told you, get up out of that grave. When you want to lay down, get up. you got to help her. And it, emotionally, the same way, when you don't want to do it anymore. I mean, no parents have a hard time when there's more than one. And they're little, and it's just hard. But you know what? It's rewarding. You know, it, it really is. So this morning, we're going to dedicate them, but you need to promise to one another and to the Lord that you're going to do your best to bring him, let these little feet walk to church when they can because that's just a natural thing. Uh, watch over their education. You've got to watch in the society we live in what you expose that little mind to. you just got to raise them up and protect them and just know that every child is different. Now, your boy is different from her, isn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. But the point is, you've got to bring them up individually. Understand what God created them to be and draw that out of them so they can be everything. My granddaughter, Lexi, sings. Her brother could care less about singing. He likes other stuff. So you, but you've got to train her to do that and allow that to happen, and et cetera, et cetera. In my time, it, talking is over. She's had enough. We've got a couple gifts for you here, her first Bible autographed by nobody then you've got just the flowers that represent that now i'm going to take the baby don't don't talk to me <laughs> that's the last thing What do you think about that? It's awesome. All right. And you can get these things. I, I, I'm not as strong as I used to be. Man. I told them I was going to do that. but You know what? I don't know if anybody really sensed it this morning, but there was a special anointing on our worship this morning, on them, but also on all of us that are in this room as we responded to what God was doing. And so what I'm... I've been, we've been talking, Ben and I, mostly me, but on, on the armor of God and protecting ourselves from, just from the schemes of the enemy. And so we finished last week, but today it's time to face the giants that have been defeating us for years. So, yes, I asked them to sing that one song this morning. I did do that because I wanted you to learn. You know, things don't go away just because we pray and we do different things. We've got to defeat the enemy in the name of Jesus with his power and with his might. There's a story that I read years ago, and I'm going to read it again. It talked about a, a young boy, seven, good swimmer. But mom and dad encouraged him to go up on the high dive, 12 foot up, 
and to jump in. Now, he had a moment to decide as he looked around and saw everybody watching. He knew if he were to jump, he would get accolades, probably get candy from the grandparents, all that kind of stuff. But there was that moment of hesitation where he walked, turned around, and walked away. And can I say something to you? Every single day, all of us face that situation where we've got to take a step of faith. We've had a vision. We've gone through the armor of God defeating the enemy. We had a vision of what God wants us to be. But there's something that stifles us every single time. It could be facing a neighbor, facing your son, facing your daughter, confronting the boss, whatever it amounts to. We've got to learn there's a step of faith to defeat that giant. He's not going away. He's blocking your path. And the giants are in our minds. I believe the Lord's a healer. You, you heard that. And the only thing stopping it is between our ears and these giants standing up and taunting us and saying, you're going to die. You're going to suffer the rest of your life. I'm going to live and not die. How about you? I just dedicated a beautiful little girl. You know how many people have told me I would never want to bring up a child in this world? But you know how many people told me that 50 years ago? I'd never want to bring up a child in this world. If we listen to that lousy giant saying, don't have babies. Hey, if you're over 50, don't have any babies. Heck, if you're 70-something going to your son's ball game, you're too old. That's what I say. But we can't let it stifle us, whatever it is. With God's help, we can bring up our children in the fear of God in any society, under any president, under any circumstances in the world because no one is greater than Jesus Christ in this realm. And we give ourselves to him, we allow that to happen. I believe it with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. I'm going to read Numbers chapter 13 for you. It should be up here, starting with verse 17. Most of you know the story, but it's about the children of Israel as Moses took them out of Egypt for 40 years being promised to go to the promised land. God promised them, called Canaan. They called the land of milk and honey, a land of prosperity. And so that, this is what they're facing. They're there, ready to cross. And so finally they said, let's pick out 12 spies. Let's go check out the land. Let's see if it's good. Well, number one, they should have known it was good because God said it was good. And he took them there. But 12 spies went out. Well, let me read it for you. Then Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan. He said to them, go up this way to the south, go up to the mountains, see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell there are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are camps or strongholds whether the land is rich or poor, or whether these are forests or there is not any. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up, spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin all the way down through that, and go on to the next one. Then they came to the valley of Eshkil, and they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between the two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. I wouldn't be happy with that, but they were. The place was called the Valley of Ishkel because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down was there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, prosperous. And this is the fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. They were giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land to the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people. He told them to shut up. 
And he said, let us go up at once and take possession. For we are able, well able, to overcome it. But, I hate that word. The men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people. For they're stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they spied out, saying, The land, though which we have gone as spies, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who we saw there are of great stature. Father, your word this morning, help us as we go through this in our own minds, in our own situations. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, how many know a bad report usually trumps a good report? It spreads like wildfire. God had them for 40 years wandering, told them about Canaan. It was a great land. And they went in and spied, and the grapes, in my mind, I picture them as big as apples. I mean, huge things, figs. You're darn tootin'. I do not like fig newtons. Anybody here? Oh, man. But just, just the land was prosperous, everything they went. That would be like... One of us going out, we just got a job that makes 500000 a year. It's got all these benefits. Man, all kinds of good stuff. But there's a giant block in our way. So here's what we got to discover. The giant of unbelief. What's blocking your way? What's blocking your way? Pastor, I want to ask so-and-so out on a date. But she's just too beautiful for me. But he has no hair. I can't ask him. One of those things. What's stopping you? What's stopping you from going after that promotion? What's stopping you from doing what God wants you to do? What's the report? I believe God wants us well and healed. And we'll hear a good report that God's a healer. In the, in the word it says he heals, he heals. But you'll hear from your relatives. But my, if whatever disease you've got, someone knows someone who had that that died. Someone knows someone who had that that suffered profusely. I'm telling you, we serve a God who's bigger and greater than somebody else. Always. That giant of unbelief that says, man, we want to go back to slavery. We want to go back to eating the land of Egypt. We don't want to go forward anymore. Unbelief. We don't believe we can. We don't deserve it. We are no good. That giant of unbelief has to be slain in the name of Jesus. And the only way it will go away is by you conquering it in the, his name. I'll never get over this situation. Yes, you will. Come on. Don't succumb to those giants that say you can't, you won't, you'll never. I'm still believing God for revival. We had an evangelist here in 1997. And he wouldn't go away. He was there for a long time. But they just celebrated his wife's 80th birthday, Brother uh, Davis, you know, Laverne. He could sing like an angel. And he was a southerner. But you know what? He was here for revival for seven weeks. The Spirit of God moved. We saw people. You know, you want to know what a holy roller is? You should have been there because people would be prayed for. They would fall down. He was up here, and the Spirit of God caught him, and we used to have microphones with wires in them. And all of a sudden, I'm, this was a Friday night, I'm sitting there, and I hear, woo, 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 woo. And he's going in circles, wrapping himself with a microphone, and he goes down. I thought I was watching an episode of The Three Stooges. <laughs> and then, I mean, and he stayed down, so I thought, what am I going to do? So I got up here and did something. But the power of God was so awesome. In this place, I believe it's going to happen again. And I believe people are hungry. We're living in a society that's pointed in the wrong direction. And someone's got to straighten it out. And I believe God's going to straighten it out through his Holy Spirit. And he's going to do it. And because people are hungry for what God wants to do. We need to slay the giant of unbelief. If someone says, God's going to get you out of debt with your cooperation. First thing that will come to your mind is, no, I don't believe it. God can heal you. I don't believe it. God, here's one for you. God will fill you with the Holy Spirit. Not for me. I've already tried. You've got to get to the point where you believe God can and will 
Why wait till tomorrow when he can do it today? I believe he is. Unbelief, the second giant that we've got to face is a giant of fear. Everybody's afraid of something. I'm going to ask you a question. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid Kamala Harris will be elected president. I'm afraid Trump will be elected president. I'm not saying I'm saying that. I'm just saying people are saying those different things for different people. I'm afraid this is going to happen or that's going to happen. I'm afraid there's going to be a nuclear war. If there is, don't worry about it. You'll be melted anyway. It doesn't matter. Just be ready to go when it's time. I believe I just, I'm just fearful of getting cancer. I'm fearful of this disease. I'm fearful of that. My mother had this, but my father had that. I'm afraid it's going to come upon me. Don't be afraid. Let's march forward. People will never listen to me, as a preacher would say. I'm the least person, except for Mark Farmer, he, he deserves it less than me, of being called a pastor. He was a repo. Before he was a pastor, he repoed things from people. Back in the day, satellite dishes. Who wants them anymore? I'll tell you what. But we all did something different. But God called us, marked us, put his hand upon us and said, preach the gospel. Don't you worry about convincing people to believe. He will do the convincing. And if God convinces you, you won't change your mind. It's, just, it's that simple. So fear, fear has torment. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Power, love, a sound mind. Allow it to penetrate you and stop being afraid. Just walk out there. Don't be foolish, but don't be afraid to do what God's calling you to do. You know why some people never receive Christ as their Savior? Because guys like him and I, occasionally Ben, will call for an altar call and say, come forward. Come forward. You know why we do that? We don't get any extra pay if you walk forward. We don't get to pat ourselves on the back because we know if you'll confess Christ before men, he'll confess you before other people. If you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. And so we have that altar call to get you to confirm your faith, to walk forward. And when you do, man, there's just something about it. Amen? Something about it. So, But what keeps people in their seat? Fear. What is so-and-so going to think? We were, where was I? Oh, we were at a golf outing Friday. And my four grandsons were playing. And they ousted me from the team. Can you believe that? I was a little bit offended. Since I'm the one that paid for that dumb thing. So I golfed with three other older guys. And I was the youngest among them. That tells you how far we got. But, but he won a prize. You know, Sons has all kinds of little gimmicks to fundraise. And so he won this prize. But he said, Grandpa, I don't want to walk up there. I'm afraid. He said, get up there. He went and got it. But, you know, just the fear put, glues you in your seat. A sales call. Fear glues you. I mean, we've got to conquer that fear in the name of Jesus. That giant's going down. Amen. Amen. The next giant. Oh, man, you'll love this one. Or maybe you won't. Is complacency or comfort. You know what these Israelites said as they were in prison for all those years and they were circling? You know what they said? You know what? Egypt wasn't so bad. Let's go back there. You know, I've seen many a man delivered from alcohol you know, alcoholics, drugs, etc. you know, gambling, pornography. But when they have a bad month or a bad day, ah, maybe that wasn't so bad. I'm going back. I'm going to go back and spend my whole paycheck that I've earned to pay for the family bills. I'm going to spend it on gambling. I'm going to spend it on this and that. Let's go back where we didn't have no frick. Let's go back. No, sir. If you go back, you're going to find it's the same that you left it. So we've got to learn that sometimes we can get complicit and we can just be satisfied where we're at. And I'm telling you, comfort shouldn't be the goal. You know, the only thing I fear about retirement whenever it happens is just having nothing to do. Pat and Mark will tell you, I'm a man of action and energy. 
I need to do something. He's sleeping. I'm already out there golfing or fishing or going around the, in, in the days in the boat because I want to do something with my life. I don't want to just retire and do nothing. Cutting the grass, don't get it for me. Weed whacking, don't get it for me. What gets it for me is doing what God called me to do. And whatever, and what God called me to do, you would be satisfied in what he's called you to do. If he's called you to cut the grass like Gary Fitz, cut it with all your might. Hallelujah. Get off that thing once in a while and weed whack. Our whole grass will be yellow someday, man, from poison. But he's good at it. He's particular. I cut the grass a couple weeks ago because I didn't think he was coming because of rain. He was upset because I had crooked lines. <laughs> Being insulted the way I was, I said, I'm not cutting it no more. <laughs> but you know what? A person that likes certain things, that's the way they like it. So we can't get complicit. You can't really be satisfied where you're at with the Lord. I believe all of us have more to give and more to do. It holds us back. These comfort zones hold us back. And here's my favorite one in closing. And I know Steve Bonner said amen to this, but here it is. Procrastinating. You never get started. I tell Pat, I don't know what's so hard about taking a shower, but man, I think, oh, man, I got to take a shower. Not that I, t I take one every day, but just so you know. It's just getting to it, getting to this thing. I'd, I'd just rather lay down and fall asleep, but i got to get up, take that shower, brush my teeth, and go to bed. It's just sometimes I just lay there and let the world go away. But starting a project, starting to read the Bible, helping someone, doing what God's called us to do, teaching a class, doing whatever it is, God's called something stops up. That giant says, do it tomorrow. Tomorrow is a curse word. Do it today. Do it today. Live in the now. Get started now. God can heal you now. God can start your prosperity program now. 10, 15 years ago, I don't know when I started this, I was trying to get people to pay off their bills and to be debt free. How many think that would be a good idea? There's several of us that are debt-free because we followed the formula. It's not my thinking. Heck, I'd never know how to do that. I'd buy everything in sight. But now, I was going to buy, I was, they auction off golf clubs at this. I was going to get me a set. But, man, he said, we can't even start the bidding, which they did, but they couldn't sell them unless they got $850 for a four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I said, I can't justify spending that on a golf club that's going to end up not doing me any good. You know, it's not the clubs that make the golfer. I can't say the word I'm thinking. It's not the club. It's the person swinging the club. And so that's, this is what I'm trying to say. We've got to learn to start today. How many like to lose 20 pounds before Thanksgiving? Let's start the day before Thanksgiving. And then we'll put it off. And then we'll just say, well, let's wait till after Thanksgiving. Let's wait till after Christmas. Then you never, ever get started. So I think procrastination robs us of opportunities for Jesus. It robs us from the opportunity to be successful. And many times it robs us from the opportunity for salvation. I'm going to read you out of Acts chapter 24, and I promise you I'm going to close. You know, a lot of us as preachers, we learn. I write everything down, but I never use everything. I just write it down for my own sake so I can feel like I've done something for the week. But in 24, this, it's talking about the Apostle Paul being in prison, being brought to a certain place, and basically on trial. And in, in, where do I want to start this? Eh, do I got it up there? Okay. No, that's not it. That's another one. I'll... This is the second to last thing I'm going to say. But starting with verse 22, a little work. Paul's brought before this governor, this king. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, the gospel, he adjourned the process and said, 
when Lystras, the commissioner, comes down, I'll make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty and told him not to forget his friends. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. He hesitated in making a decision for Christ. And you know what? There's no recording that he ever made that decision for Christ. He put it off for another day. Can I tell you, today is a day of salvation. Today is a day God's dealing with your heart. Not tomorrow, but today. Don't be like him. I'm going to, I'll send him away, and maybe I'll do it at a different time. And in this scripture, it talks about ten girls, ten young maidens, that there was a wedding. They were waiting for the bridegroom to come, and he waited a long time. There was ten. Five were prepared, brought extra oil for their lamps, and five did not. And suddenly I had to cry at midnight was, behold, the bridegroom comes. Get ready. The bridegroom comes. So the five that were ready were ready. They had oil. The others, their oil went out. And they begged the others for more oil. But it was too late. Here's my situation. They procrastinated. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. And when the time came, they weren't ready. Can I tell you, death comes for all of us. It's got no favorites. Every person in this room sometime will be facing the slab or the furnace, whatever it is. We all die, all of us. And you don't know when that's going to come. Every, I don't know about me. I've had two brushes with death. Mark's had some. We all had brushes with death we didn't expect. And, you know, when they knock you out for surgery, you don't remember anything. You might not wake up. So be ready before the time comes. Be ready for Jesus. Be ready for his coming. Many believe we live in the days when Christ could return. You've heard it all your life. I've heard it forever. But we have never been in a society like there is today, ever. We've never been in a place where things can switch on a dime as today. So I'm just begging everyone in this room, be ready. I can say, behold, the bridegroom comes. Or I can say the gospel's been explained to you. Are you ready? If your time came in 30 seconds, are you ready? You know, we've had people in this auditorium have heart issues and gone down. We've called the ambulance several times in here. Fortunately, they all made it. Amen? We got paddles back there. But nobody knows how to use them. And the doctors aren't here today. I'd try it on you, but I'm not sure what would happen. So I'm just saying, you better be ready. Amen. So let's all stand. You know, I'm going to have the worship team as they hurry their way up here. No fellowship on the way up. I want to sing that champion song again. I know Lexi's going back to school pretty soon. But I want everybody with heads bowed, eyes closed, even if you don't bow or close your eyes, I want you to think just for a moment. Two things. What giant is standing in your way? Is it unbelief? Is it fear? Is it complacency? Are you procrastinating, making decisions to pull out of it? And one decision that I need you to make today is a decision for Jesus Christ. I'm trying to convince you that he died for you, he died for your sins, he lives within you once you receive him, he'll never leave you, never forsake you, he will lead and guide your life if you'll listen to him. So I'm asking everyone here, if you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you're ready to meet the Lord, should your time come today, now, let me see your hands. You're ready. You know you're ready. Thank you. God bless you. I've done my job a little bit. But how many are here today you couldn't raise your hand or you wouldn't raise your hand because fear kept your hand down? I'm calling on you this morning. If you want to receive Christ, put it behind you. 